ungrateful, entitled, self-absorbed, selfish, spoiled brat. These are the words that come to mind when I think of Veruca Salt. Roald Dahl's character in his classic children's book, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Now, Veruca is one of these very entitled little girls who believes that everything should come to her when she wants it. She shouldn't have to wait. She shouldn't have to say thank you. And if she wants something and she doesn't get it, she screams and screams and screams until daddy gives in and gives it to her. Now, some of you have read Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and you know that Veruca is one of five lucky young kids who gets to go and tour Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory that has been a mystery to the town for almost 40 years. No one has been inside. No one has seen the wonders of this factory. And this young lady gets one of those golden tickets to be able to see something that the world has never seen. But that means nothing to her. She wants more. More, more. And when she gets into the chocolate factory and she begins this amazing tour, she just can't help herself. She's got to have something that she's not entitled to. Deserve. But she chases it anyways. And comes to a very unfortunate end. I don't want to spoil the book for you. (laughs) But I think when we hear those words, ungrateful, entitled, self-absorbed, selfish, spoiled, we begin to have some images in our own head, right? We begin to connect those words with individuals or groups of people, maybe even with ourselves. And over 2,000 years ago, Jesus tried to help us connect those words with the image of a younger son. A younger son who had a father who was working hard and had earned a good living, had created a a estate that was very wealthy. And he had promised his sons, when it is my time, when I die, this will all be handed over to you. You'll split it 50-50. Now, that should have probably been enough for those sons, right? Knowing that they were taken care of, that they didn't have anything to worry about. And for the older son, that seemed to be a good way of life. But for the younger son, no way. Not fast enough. Not in my time. I want it now. And you're going to give it to me. Now, as a parent, I can't imagine a child coming up to me and saying that and then being as calm and collected as the father and just saying, okay, you know, this was supposed to come to you when I die, but if you can't wait and you want it now, here you go. Now, I don't know what that took. I mean, most In that time period, most of the wealth was tied up into land, so I'm assuming that in order for the father to give the son what he wanted, he probably had to sell off something that was very valuable to him, an asset, part of his land, in order to make that happen. 
But I also can see the father saying, I'm going to put my trust in you, son, and, and I think you're going to go out and use this money as, as it's intended and make a life for yourself. But the temptation was very strong. You know, just think about all those uh, folks that come into money at an early age and don't really know what to do with it. And all of a sudden, it gets squandered. And you go out and you have a lot of fun. You throw money around here and there and everywhere. And then all of a sudden, there's nothing left. And all of a sudden, the son has squandered his entire inheritance and he's left to have to pick up the pieces of his life. And he starts by going and just getting any menial job that he can find. And in fact, he gets one where he's feeding pigs and he gets to a point where this is just, you know, he's, he's working, but he's not making enough. He's just starving. He's destitute. And he says, well, you know what? I'm just going to go back to my father and I'm going to grovel. And I'm just going to lay it out there and just hope that my father will take me back and, and just give me one of these jobs on his, you know, in his business. And so he starts that march home. And we can kind of see it's kind of like that walk of shame, right? And how do we carry ourselves when we're filled with guilt and shame and regret? I don't know, often a head's down, kind of, kind of just plodding along. And I just want to see this picture that Jesus paints for us in this story. And Jesus was a master storyteller. And each of the things that Jesus said in his stories there's something important to look for. And it may seem just like a, a very small thing. It might just be a couple words or a, a verse, but it has such a powerful impact on the story. And so here is this younger son who has really epitomized and, and, and just has modeled what it means to be selfish and absorbed and, and entitled and ungrateful and I want you to think for yourself, if you were the father, if you were the parent, what would you think if you saw that child coming down the road? Now, I know I would love to say that I would do just as Jesus describes in how this father responds to his son but I know myself. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I get entitled. I deserve something from this son of mine who took what I earned and threw it all away. Oh, he's got some serious work to do with me. Right? And he is going to come to me I'm not going to him, right? Because that's our pride, right? I'm not going to him. He is coming to me. And I'm going to sit here until he comes in and apologizes for absolutely everything he's done wrong. But that's not the picture that Jesus paints for us in this story. Because not only does the father not stay in the house, he goes outside of the house. And Scripture tells us that he sees his son when he is a long way off. Now, we don't know what that means. But you can imagine that, you know, on a good day, we can see a couple miles down the road, right? Right? And it doesn't say that the father just stood outside his door and waited for his son to come to him with that apology. 
it says that he ran, ran to meet his son and to embrace him before he even got close to the house. Now again, just imagine that son walking like this. And all of a sudden, he looks up, and here is his father running to him and throwing his arms around him. And he doesn't have to say a word. In fact, he begins this speech that he is already pre-planned, right? Well, Father, I'm so sorry. His father won't even let him get the words out before he's telling the people to grab the coat and put it on him and go and kill the fattened calf and we're going to have this celebration for my son has come home. There's not even any negotiation of terms or forgiveness. It's this unconditional grace and love that he is shown by this parent that he expected was going to punish him and, and make him just do this tough, just unbelievable hard job to kind of earn his trust and his love back. That was his expectation. But Jesus blows our mind. Takes all of our expectations and throws them out the window. And says, no. You can't earn this. You can't earn my love. What I'm offering is grace upon grace upon grace. Now on your connection card today, there's a, there's a box that says to think about a time when you have de- received undeserved forgiveness. What did that feel like? How did you respond to it? I mean, it catches us off guard, doesn't it? You know, we're, we're sort of in, in a culture that is, you know, it's a supply and demand culture, and, and we kind of figure that, you know, we have, to, we have to earn everything. That we have to give in order to get. And Jesus shows us not just in this story, but through his life and through his ministry, that grace comes freely. And Jesus himself became incarnate grace. Grace that we can wrap our hands around, that we can feel those hands of our parent God wrapped around us tight, offering us that forgiveness. And that does something amazing for us, doesn't it? It breaks down so many walls, so many barriers. It puts us on a different path. Because when we can't forgive or we won't forgive, we often lead down a path or are led down a path of anger and resentment and bitterness. How many of us have been there? I don't want to stay there. That is a world I do not want to be in for long. Because it is a place that seems awfully hard to climb out of. And Jesus doesn't want that for our lives either. And what he models and what he shares in the story about the father, about the parent who offers this forgiveness 
is a way out of that life. And it doesn't mean that we don't have the right to be angry sometimes because that's a natural human emotion. But Jesus doesn't want us to stay in that life because that life only leads to death. But with forgiveness, there is an opportunity for new life. For us, when we need forgiveness, for those who have hurt us when they need forgiveness, it's a way to break that cycle of anger and retaliation and retribution and violence. And it's not easy. But it's what we're called to through Christ. And our message series for this Lenten season is, Why Jesus? Why is Jesus so important? And I think today, it's because he models that incarnate grace that God offers to us, and that through that, we're called to offer it to others. May it be so. Amen.